Hey, welcome to the essential truths of internet marketing that never changes. Uh, I'm Dave D from GKIC, and here we have Mr. Dan Kennedy. Enthusiastic, mm -hmm. enthusiastic they yes. are because you were so nice to them before <laughs> yeah. before the camera yeah. rolled. Yeah, well, um, well, we have four hours. You better be enthusiastic <laughs> if they're not very good looking. So <laughs> <laughs> you got to kind of bring something to the you, table. You, you absolutely do. Well, we have an incredible program planned for you today. It's four hours of Dan teaching you what he knows about real the real truths about internet marketing. So Dan, the, the tubes, <laughs> the tubes, the tubes, the tubes. Yeah. Well, because the, here's the truth, um, almost all the big name gurus that you know of internet marketing go and consult with Dan. They pay him $18,800 a day. Uh, they hire him to do copy and all kinds of things. So what we're going to be talking about here are things that actually positively work and will continue working. So we're not talking about things that are going to come and go or the newest whiz-bang trick. We're talking about fundamental direct response marketing principles that you can use on the internet. So Dan, this first segment is called the Foundations of Internet Marketing. And so I want to start with this. A lot of people think whenever there's a new media that it's completely different, uh, that everything's changing, that this is going to wipe out all the other media. Talk a little bit about that. Well, if you live long enough, you will see that and you will hear that a number of times. So as you say, it, it is always thought, it is always believed. So every time something came along, about the only time it's ever been true, I think, is, uh, is the destruction of silent movies mm -hmm. uh, uh, replaced with sound. Mm -hmm. uh, that pretty much actually happened. Although, a couple years ago, he won the won Academy the, Award, yeah, right? Yeah. won the Academy Award. But, um, but other than that, so everybody has believed it, has radio happened, has talk radio happened, has satellite radio, everybody has believed it about every media. It's never really been true. Hardly any media has actually perished. Generally speaking, they have gained uh, reinforcement, assistance from each other as, as they have grown. I think the big caution to watch out for is sort of the wizards of the new media in whose best interest it is to have you believe that there are new and pretty much incomprehensible rules uh, for the new media because otherwise they're not as necessary as they would like to be. And so from a foundational standpoint, um, media is a toolbox and it gives, as we add media, it gives us more tools, but it doesn't really change the successful application of the tools. And it's somewhat dangerous to buy into the idea that it does. I think some of the people think that you may be anti-internet, which is completely false. No, there's a distinction between um, a, a personal bias mm -hmm. and pragmatism. So from a personal standpoint, uh, yeah, I am anti-internet. Right. Uh, if I, and there's sort of an increasing little uh, consensus uh, growing, you know, that it may not have been the best thing to let out of the box from a societal standpoint and now from a security standpoint. Uh, there's an editorial in the New York Times literally today as we are, are doing this by somebody who, uh, who is well respected uh, and not viewed as a, uh, as, an old, as a grumpy old man who is really talking about the security problems that this thing mm -hmm. unleashes. And I, so I don't care for it personally, and I don't use it personally. And if I want something from Amazon, that's what a post-it note is for. And, and a fax you, machine. Yeah, and a fax machine. But, um, but that's personal, you know. From a business standpoint, um, I, I, again, it's more tools in the toolbox. So I have no pragmatic objection to any of it. And um, in our businesses, as an author and for clients, uh, make a great deal of use of it, and not grudgingly. Uh, and in fact, I would, I would like some of what people believe to be true about it now to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we really could, for example, eliminate the expense of offline marketing and get the same results with online only, I'd be the first guy mm -hmm. in the cheering sec section 
uh, that doesn't happen to be true, but if it were true. So, no, I, I have no um, application bias against it. In fact, in fact, like you said, you, we use it. Uh, first of all, in our own business, you use it as an author. Uh, you, every, I, every one of your clients. You, I have you, one. You, you have I, one client doesn't use it? I have one client who does absolutely nothing okay. online, um, but, but only one. Mm-hmm. Everybody else is, you know, somewhere between knee deep and shoulder deep in it, mostly integrated. Right. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, but I have a couple of clients who are heavily weighted sure. to online. Sure. And I think one of the best things I've heard you say, one of the greatest distinctions was that you don't know how to make the printing press work either. So talk a little bit about that. Because I think a lot of people get hung up on that. Yeah, well, we were, so we were at a seminar, Joe Sugarman seminar, for those of you who know Joe. And... Um, this is some years ago. And Joe encountered a Microsoft executive on his morning walk on the beach who he invited to come in and talk to us. Small group. And, uh, small group of direct response. Small group of heavy direct hitters. response heavy, heavy hitters. hitters. Right. And so sitting next to me was a guy at the time who was probably, probably sell, have, with his entire client base, selling more goods on QVC than anybody else on home shopping. And uh, so we come back from a break, and the Microsoft guy has papered all four walls of the room with diagrams, Uh-oh. which, you know, is not <laughs> a good sign. And uh, he proceeds now to describe how the tubes work. And um, after about 15 minutes, the QVC guy stands up and says, Kennedy doesn't know how a lumber mill works either. Now, the guy didn't even, like, get it, mm-hmm. but the point was, I'm mailing paper and ink, and I don't know how we get to paper and ink. Mm-hmm. He's selling $100 million worth of stuff on TV and has no idea how the signal gets from here <laughs> to Martha's home, you know, nor do we care, mm-hmm. right? I mean, so there's, there's the technical, which generally speaking, marketing people always have somebody else do the technical, you don't go run the printing press. Right. You don't. You don't. Uh, you don't make the signal move. There's mm-hmm. people sitting over there who know how to do that. Neither you or I could go do that. I don't right. think you could go no. do it. Um, so why would we need to know this? Right. I mean, so that's I, not the part that makes you the money. That's exactly not the part that makes makes, makes you the money. So let's talk a little bit about. Oh, by um, the way, it can't even get in your way. Okay. So the people who come to this from the tech side. Um, and are and think because they understand the tech that they are smarter than those of us who don't understand mm-hmm. the tech. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, run the risk of being monkeys with type typewriters trying to do, do a novel. Right. Got you it. Know. Got it. Let's talk about. Um, no disrespect to you, monkeys over there with the typewriters. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're just endearing yourself to everyone. You haven't insulted the viewing audience of 5,000 people. We'll viewing. get yeah, there. We'll get there, though. We'll get there. We'll get there. So that's the fantastic. The day is young. <laughs> so one of the key things that uh, is ha- obviously to good online marketing is having a good direct response website. What are some of the key elements that you need in a good direct response website? And are there different types of websites for different businesses? Yeah, and I'm kind of going to run through that right. when I get over there. But yeah, absolutely. There are. First of all, there are reasons to have non-direct response sites. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there are legitimate reasons to have them, as long as you don't expect them to create response, because that's not what they're for, right? But yeah, there's all sorts of different sites, and and when you get into direct response sites, as in any other media, again, where you're going to put the word direct response in front of it, mm-hmm. it dictates that it function in a way that creates direct response. Mm-hmm. So that's really the biggest fact is if the site is engineered in any way that interferes with, distracts from, derails the completion of an act of response, then it's not a true Mm -hmm. direct response site. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of people will, um, will turn that over to people who are, again, not direct response people. And will sort of bow to what they now advise right. because they're confused by, the, by technology. the technology and they believe because it's a different media that 
different rules apply. And again, this isn't new, you know. I mean, it, it, the Yellow Pages for years tried to convince everybody that different rules apply to a Yellow Pages ad than to an ad, say, in a newspaper or a magazine. And they tried to do that mostly so that the Yellow Pages ad would not be held as ruthlessly accountable mm -hmm. for response. So, you know, John puts a newspaper ad in on Tuesday. He expects results on Wednesday. So the Yellow Pages folks really didn't want that sort of day-to-day right. -day expectation, you know. And, and so people like me literally pioneered direct response Yellow Pages ads mm -hmm. that were held to the standard and purpose of does this drive direct response? Does this element drive direct response? If it doesn't, why give up any real estate to it? Mm -hmm. And the other danger with websites is the idea that there's unlimited a real estate. So if, we buy, if we're paying for a full page ad in a magazine, A, we have a limited amount of space, and we've written a check for it. And every word matters. Every word matters, every square inch matters, right. and, and, and people sort of understand that where they're not directly writing a check for it and there's an unlimited amount of it, which is basically a website, mm -hmm. right? People get kind of sloppy about considering every square inch, every word, every page, every function, is this moving us to direct response mm. or isn't it moving us to direct mm. response? Mm. You talk about that a lot uh, with email too, uh, which is part of internet marketing obviously where, you know, if, God, well, we, we have to send out a sales letter We've got to pay for that letter to go out. We've got to focus in on every little detail. When somebody's writing a check for $2,000 or $20,000 or $200,000, depending upon their business, uh, for stamps, let alone the printing and mm -hmm. you know, all of that, they tend to be less casual about it than when they can slap it together, push a button, and out it goes. Right? The hidden costs of all that are that you are using up um, customer and audience interest. And so you don't write a check for that, but if you do enough bad, sloppy, hasty, unthoughtful communication, gradually people stop paying attention to you at all. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. So you're not writing a check for it, but what you're saying is it is coming out of your pocket. It's coming out of your pocket. Yeah, it's coming. And out you will ultimately have to write a check uh, because you'll be digging yourself out of a hole that you suddenly find find yourself in. And then even more insidious are the guys that say, "Oh, okay, I heard that Dan say I got to go offline, so I'm going to do it." But then they use those same sloppy tactics that they're using online to put, it, and then they say, "Well, it doesn't work." Well, look, as you know, the, the number probably the the number one cause of failure in marketing is underestimating the difficulty of the right. task, right? And unfortunately, online encourages that underestimation more than offline. But the people who have survived as online marketers only and actually have been one step away from spam, mm -hmm. which by the way, I saw, I just quoted it. I'm not gonna remember it exactly, but I think it's 134 billion emails and uh, 86 billion of them are spam. Um, so if you subtract that and then you take out the personal stuff, right. me emailing you right. a joke, and you, you take right. all that out, right. and you take out the porn industry, right. there's like 12 commercial emails left <laughs> at, at the bottom of that pile. Um, uh, but yeah, the guys that have been living on, it's free, so let's send a lot of it. And let's not worry about tiny response percentage mm -hmm. or diminishing response mm -hmm. percentage. And the reaction to the diminishing response percentage is let's send more. Right, exactly. Right? Let's send more, and let's right. send more, and let's send more. And you saw a cycle of one a day to two a day to three a day to five a day. All that does, because it is still fundamentally the equivalent of a phone call mm -hmm. or a knock on the door, mm -hmm. right? And so if you come around the neighborhood and knock on the doors once, and that doesn't get you the results you want, and you try knocking on every door five times a day, that will still not get you the, and it will ultimately get you banned from the neighborhood. But that's exactly what happens. Great, fantastic. So you talked a little bit about websites. You're gonna go show some? Sure. Are you ready to do Talk that? Talk about some and show some. Fantastic, All right. let's do it. All right, let's hear it for Dan Kennedy.
Now, while we're waiting for Dan to get set up and get ready here, we do have a very special offer for you. If you would like the DVDs and the CDs of today's video training, uh, absolutely unedited, uncut, so because there's going to be so much great information during this four-hour period, you're going to have the opportunity to get it. Uh, in addition to that, as part of this package, you're going to get a manual of today's training. Now, this is not just a transcription. This is really, it's edited, it's enhanced, making it very, very easy for you to use. In addition to that, Dan's going to be showing you some examples. Uh, we have so many examples to show you that, quite frankly, we can't fit them all in. We would be here for three days. So there's a hundred plus pages of examples that are, do not make it into this training. You're going to get that as well. On top of that, there's a bonus. Uh, we have our head copywriter right now taking live notes during this training. You're going to get a copy of his notes, and which are really, really good, probably with some of his insights as well. There's also a number of different bonuses that you're going to get, uh, and you can see all of those right online. Now, really important, we've got a special bonus for you just for people who uh, invest in this package today. And that bonus is a teleseminar that uh, Darcy Juarez and myself are going to be doing. It's a follow-up advanced teleseminar. We'll be doing live Q&A as well. Also, you're going to get access to the replay links of this um, starting at 3 p.m. tomorrow. By the way, there is no rebroadcast of this. The only way to get this is to invest in this package. All right, and so now let's move over. So uh, take action and get it immediately. Let's move over to Dan Kennedy. By the way, you'd be here for three days. I wouldn't be <laughs> no. here for three days, regardless of how many examples you wanted to show. So, so what we were talking about is the website is essentially your place online. And so that might be your store, that might be your seminar, that might be your catalog, but it's really your place online. And there are critical decisions to make about what you do with that place or places, which is really what in this segment we'll talk about. So website design is a situational issue. There is no one magic pill for this. There is no one right way any more than there is with any other media. So if we had the same conversation about what's the best brochure, what's the best sales letter for format, what's, what's the best speech for format, the answer would be it depends. And so there are different types of sites for different purposes. There's the issue of online and offline integration. Sometimes there are controls forced upon you uh, depending on what you are trying to do with the site and what environment that you are in. So we'll go through some of the types and the purposes. Some of them I'll just skim through quickly. Uh, some of them we'll spend some time on. The first three we'll just mention very quickly. One, there is a place for a non-direct response site where we're not trying to move anybody to any action. We're not even trying to do any capture. We are just dispensing information. These are often customer service sites rather than they are marketing sites. So it's the, after you've bought this stuff at Ikea and you are now at home and you have 12 screws and one shelf left over, there's a place to go to see the video of what it is you're trying to build. A lot of utilitarian purposes, news releases, information to, to, um, to um, media and so forth. Sometimes you have sites that have to meet requirements, uh, Google's for example, uh, but these are the ones that really get interesting because they're where we can make things happen. So lead generation sites that lead into a sales process, there's soft capture of leads, there's hard capture of leads, there's forced capture of leads, there's capture of leads plus getting information, there's making a direct sale, and there's a direct sale with a sales presentation. That's where we're going to spend our time. Before we get there, though, let me quickly take you through some of the dangers when you have websites built and online marketing built. So one is the tech crowd. And we, Dave and I just talked a little bit about that. Um, we don't let mechanics actually design the car. Um, we don't let bricklayers actually do the architecture. And so we, we don't let graphic artists control the copy. And so we don't let the mechanics actually control what it is that we do on the web. There's a lot of hazards with that. Uh, if they have a box full of gadgets, they feel compelled to use all the gadgets every single time. We don't necessarily want them to use all the gadgets. There's the art crowd, uh, which anytime you turn graphic designers loose on direct response media without adult supervision, 
you are uh, asking for trouble. Uh, often ugly beats pretty, function beats award-winning graphics, and so we have to be very careful about turning them loose here, just as we would be very careful about turning them loose anywhere else. There's the culture crowd, which makes the argument that there's a culture to this place on the internet that we dare not violate. If we have an exit pop-up, we offend people. If we have forced capture, we offend people. This same argument, again, has been made about every media, every place, every marketing environment. Uh, it's made about trade shows. Oh, you can't sell at trade shows. It's a waste of time. You should just hand out brochures. And so there's a culture argument made about this media that you have to learn to violate and ignore if you are going to do direct response. There's the issue of control, the let the traffic control the process crowd, let the customer meander about as they wish. Uh, we will talk extensively about solid walls, uh, single path, narrow road to what it is that we want them to do. There's the new metrics crowd, which is, hey, we can't apply money math to this media. This has new metrics, and so we have to think in terms of uh, visitors and likes and friends. And you know, the best answer to that I've heard is is from the CEO of J. Crew, who 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 said, if you to his own team, if you would like to talk about new metrics, that's fine, as long as it's okay if on your paycheck I pay you in new metrics. If, however, you want to be paid in dollars, then we have to hold all this media accountable for dollars. So what do you want on your check on Friday? There's the concealed costs to be concerned with. We just talked about one of them, Dave and I, uh, where we're not writing a check for these things necessarily, uh, certainly not for them running on a continuous basis, but there are other costs involved. So let's talk about Soft capture, our fourth item, so one type of a site. Soft capture is where everything is optional. We are letting them have access. We are letting them get stuff. We are letting them go behind a door and see things without stopping them at the door and checking their papers. So we are making everything optional. A hard capture is where all the options are replaced with demands. In order to get through this door, you, have, you must give us certain things or do certain things. In order to get through the next door, you must do certain things or give us certain things. You see double squeeze page used in this environment a lot where email is collected first. That gets them through door number one and allows them to do certain things, but then they run up against door number two, at which point they have to give hard and full contact information uh, to get through that door. There may even now be a third door where they have to fill out a survey, fill out a questionnaire, give us additional information about themselves or their businesses in order to get through that door. Those are hard capture sites. Um, then you have on the way out those who have not done. You have the Columbo, which actually came all the way back from Ellery Queen, but is the, oh, by the way, one more thing, and mostly in this world, that's the exit pop-up. This is a gold member of our, do you remember who this is? Craig, uh, I forget. Greg Presti. Thank you. Greg Presti. Greg Presti. Um, and so this is an example of you're trying to leave, and up it comes and says, wait a minute, are you sure you want to leave? And we want some information so we can at least send you X, Y, Z, right? So that's a hard capture. This is... To give you a brick and mortar example, so this is my gardener's mattress friends. This is their little opt-in page, uh, which is driven to, of all things, by a billboard in the outfield wall of their minor league baseball team. And uh, it drives them to this to enter a contest uh, to win a free mattress. So here's the results, 34 home games this season. Average attendance of 4,000 at a game. 
which by the way, I think they're beating the Cleveland Indians, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, average attendance of 4,000. They have built a list of 3,500 people opting in. Um, so pretty much they got everybody that's going to the games. They've directly sold $27,000 worth of stuff, right, which is the meaningful number here, is we actually sold $27,000 worth of stuff. They also got CERTA to pay for the $16,000 it cost for the billboard uh, uh, because they can demonstrate that they have a real process to convert leads. So this is a pure, simple registration site. The thank you page is a pure, simple thank you for entering. And then the game begins um, with the thank you uh, email, which goes to an offer, an information offer, which now converts people who just entered the contest to actual leads versus people who just entered the contest, which then begets different follow-up for each one. One size fits all site. Probably the worst thing you can do. Right? And everybody likes to do it because it's simple. So everybody likes to do one site and then wedge everything into that site with a bunch of select buttons that just allow people to get confused and wander around and meander. And there's no solid walls. There's no narrow path. The best direct response approach is almost always multiple landing pages and sites tied to different lead generation ads and purposes. So theirs, which I just showed you, that the only traffic driven to that is driven to it from that one billboard in the baseball park. That's it. And it's a narrow track. It's a single track. Then they have a different landing page and website for their Yellow Pages ad that drives to it. And they have a different one and a different one and a different one and a different one. So laziness about this is costly. These are Dr. Burleson's. And so here's a uh, myweddingdaysmile.com, which again is a hard capture because you can't get through door number one without at least giving an email. And behind that, there'll be a hard capture of contact. Here's how much do braces cost? Find out instantly for free. Here's does your child really need braces? Here's when should kids get braces? Uh, and who said braces are pain? Now, the enormous temptation would be one site with a bunch of buttons. And most web designers would do one site with a bunch of buttons and feed all their traffic into that one site. But when people are drawn to a door by a certain message, when they enter the door, they should see consistency and congruency with the message that drew them to the door. And the more matched everything is all the way through, the better you will do. So the sixth type is forced. So the minute they land on the landing page, nothing is possible without the compliance that is required. And sometimes that can be full contact information. The seventh type of site, as I said, perhaps in stages, not only requires contact information from them, but it asks them qualifying questions. It makes them self-select. Um, it puts them through a survey, et cetera. The reason for that is to get to multiple lists instead of a single list so that we can then follow up, which we'll talk about later as the day drags on, but so that we could follow up to separate lists separately. So in the case of gardeners, again, they immediately separate based on people who just entered the contest and people who entered the contest and now requested a book about how to get a good night's sleep. They will follow up on list B very differently than they will follow up on list A. In fact, the follow up on list A will be all about getting them to still come back and request that book because if they're not going to request a book about how to get a better night's sleep, odds are we're not going to be able to sell them a mattress. Now, once they've requested the book, what can we get them to do that makes them an even better prospect so we can split them out again and continue to spend more and more time, energy, and money on the highest qualified prospects? Let me show you a site with a dramatic change in it. So this is a registration site for people to participate in coaching calls. This is from a Titanium member of mine, Adams Hudson. So here's the old site. And I have marked, actually, what you will see disappear on the new site. So the old site, here's the registration for the coaching. Here's a bunch of other stuff you can click on and go meander around in and go do. And here's a bunch of other stuff you can click on and meander around and go do. So it wasn't enough 
to have one place that you could meander off. This web designer managed to make two places that you could meander off in. Okay? So here's the site, 29% increase in our registrations. Now, first of all, you will notice it's visually better and has more sales copy about the experience that you are going to have on the call. However, the most significant thing about it is all the other places are gone. This is, here's what we want you to do. Here's the place to do it. That's it. Dedicated for this purpose, all the traffic driven to it. 29% boost in results. The eighth kind of site, I'm just going to mention very quickly, but it is one that a lot of marketers ignore, is a catalog site. Now, you still have to make decisions about how you let them enter and what you make them do before they can enter. But almost every business has an opportunity at some point to present what they do cafeteria rather than bundled or rather than single path, usually to unconverted leads and to regular customers. And the most important thing to know about what you can do with an online catalog that you cannot do with an offline catalog is right here. The online catalog allows us to expand its pages as people express interest. So every product, every page can be a portal to more information and a full-blown a sales pre presentation behind it. People can select, okay, I read two paragraphs about this product. I'm really interested in seeing a 30-minute video about this product. I'm really interested in reading a full-blown sales letter about this product. I'm interested in seeing a PowerPoint presentation about this product. So our online catalogs become endlessly expandable and really become ads that lead to full sales presentations. Retail site, physical location sites. These are, you have a brick and mortar store uh, of some kind, you have a car dealership, you have uh, uh, any place people would walk in and buy from, uh, a restaurant, those types of businesses, you are gonna have a site for them. The smart marketers still make this about selling by appointment, not selling by wander, and they still play the lead generation game. So this is a rework, very recent, of Gardner's basic retail site for a mattress store. It looks pretty different if you go to most mattress store sites because they are going to be about the store, the mattresses, the price, sort of a newspaper ad turned into a website, a Yellow Pages ad turned into a web website. This is all about getting a lead getting somebody to opt in to request a book. A video comes on and plays and so forth. Um, the site then leads to you being able to get, so the first version offered you a digital version, email only. This then now tells you why you want a hard copy and goes for full contact information, which by the way has given us two lists immediately because the person willing to give us the hard contact information and request the hard book is a better prospect than the person who would only give us email and only let us give us a digital. Um, so this version of their retail site is only uh, two weeks old and uh, it has booked five appointments so far. Uh, they sold all of them uh, and a total amount in sales of $48,000. If they did a, here we are, come on in whenever you feel like it, they might, might get more people coming in whenever they feel like it, but they would not be prepared to buy a $4,000, $6,000, $8,000 mattress, particularly when the average price of a mattress in America is $800. So by doing what they're doing, and it, it just so that you know, this is just the follow-up. I'm not going to talk you through it. It'll be in your manual, by the way. They said we could share it. So this is their Infusionsoft follow-up system just for people who visit that site. It's fairly sophisticated. It's fairly complicated. It's a lot of st steps. The last type of site is the one many of us are familiar with from the kind of business that GKIC is in, which is the direct sale via a presentation at a site. So there's a sales letter. There's an audio-assisted sales letter. There's a video-assisted sales letter. There's pure video. There's the infomercial on demand. 
There's the webinar on demand. There's launches. Um, all of these types of formats where you are getting a complete sales presentation online. A lot of people have drifted away from the pure sales letter. It is still working. Um, this is uh, Ryan Dices. Um, are we? Are you going to put the whole letter in the manual yeah. of Dices? Yeah, they're, they're okay. Getting, yeah. So this is. I don't know how many pages, but it's thick. It looks like about a 16 to 18 pager to me in print, done as a sales letter online. I have a client who's using a 48-page sales letter online. Traffic is driven to it. There's no audio assist. There's no video assist. There's no nothing. There's a sales letter literally stuck up on a website with duct tape and thumb thumbtacks, and it's converting just fine. So we'll talk about the reasons for conversion in, in the fourth time block that we have together, because most people don't understand what really causes conversion and what doesn't. 